4 August 1944, 1427 hours. Above the patchwork fields of Kent, Flying Officer T.D. Dixie Dean squeezed the trigger. Nothing. His four 20mm cannons, each capable of spitting a hundred rounds in two seconds, had jammed solid. Below him, a V-1 flying bomb droned toward London at 400 miles per hour, carrying 1,870 pounds of high explosive. 700,000 people had already fled the capital. In three minutes, this mechanical terror would add to the 22,000 casualties already suffered. Dean's propellerless aircraft, a machine so secret that local police had sealed roads during its test flights, was Britain's first jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor, and right now, it was his only weapon. He did something no pilot had ever attempted in combat. Dean pushed the throttles forward, feeling the twin Rolls-Royce turbojets surge beneath him with their eerie, whispering power. No engine roar, no propeller vibration, just pure thrust. He pulled alongside the stubby-winged missile, wingtip to wingtip, close enough to see the pulse jet's crude exhaust cone. Then, he flicked his control column, hard. The meteor's wingtip kissed the V-1's wing. Air pressure erupted. The flying bomb's gyroscope tumbled. The missile rolled, nosed over, and plummeted into an empty field near Tunbridge Wells. Dean banked away, his hands trembling. First Allied jet victory. First kill without firing a shot. The future, arriving in silence. Minutes later, Flying Officer Roger destroyed a second V-1, this time with working cannons. Thirteen more would follow, but the world didn't know about the meteor yet. Neither did America. Neither did most of the RAF, because Britain had built a weapon so revolutionary, so dangerous in enemy hands, that its own pilots were forbidden to fly it over occupied Europe. Even when Messerschmitt's ME-262 jets were shredding American bomber formations at 540 miles per hour, Meteor pilots remained grounded on home soil, watching their chance for history slip away. This is the story of the invisible fighter. Faster than anything with propellers. Quieter than thunder. And locked behind walls of secrecy even as the war reached its climax. Before we continue deeper into this unbelievable story, Take a second to like this video and subscribe for more untold war stories. Germany, July 1944. Luftwaffe intelligence had convinced itself of inevitable victory in the air. Their Messerschmitt ME-262, operational since April, represented the pinnacle of aerial warfare. 540 miles per hour, faster than any Allied fighter armed with four 30mm cannons that could shred a B-17 in seconds. The German pilots called it the Schwalbe, the Swallow. They'd seen nothing that could catch them. We felt invincible, recalled General Lieutenant Adolf Galland. The Allies had numbers, but we had the future. The V-1 campaign amplified their confidence. Since 13 June, the Vergeltungswaffe, retaliation weapon, had rained mechanical terror on London. Each buzz bomb flew too fast for most Allied fighters to intercept. Spitfire 14s and Hawker Tempest could barely match its 400 mile per hour speed at low altitude. The psychological impact was devastating. Citizens heard the pulse jet's distinctive buzz, then the silence as the engine cut out. Five seconds of waiting before detonation. German engineering doctrine preached precision over mass production. Every component was crafted, tested, optimized. The ME-262's UMO-004 engines represented years of axial flow turbojet development. Nothing the British had could compete with German technical superiority, or so they believed. Then, on 27 July 1944, Radar operators at Luftwaffe headquarters detected something impossible over the English Channel. Aircraft signatures moving at jet speeds. Multiple contacts. Not one experimental prototype. An operational squadron. 
The meteor succeeded where others failed because Britain chose pragmatism over perfection. Frank Whittle's centrifugal flow engine design was fat and inelegant compared to Germany's axial flow turbojets. It looked like a barrel bolted to each wing. But those Rolls-Royce Welland engines produced 1,700 pounds of thrust each. And crucially, they were reliable. German ME262 engines lasted 12 to 25 hours before catastrophic failure. Meteor engines ran for hundreds. The Meteor's philosophy? Dependable lethality over technical elegance. Designer George Carter understood that war didn't reward sophistication. It rewarded aircraft that could fly mission after mission without exploding. The Meteor's all-metal construction, tricycle undercarriage, and straight wings made it maintainable by mechanics who'd never seen a jet before. No exotic materials, no temperamental fuel mixtures, just robust British engineering. Squadron leader Leslie Watts climbed into the Meteor's cockpit expecting complexity. Instead, he found simplicity. No torque from a massive propeller trying to flip the aircraft. No engine that coughed and sputtered at high altitude. The throttles moved, the twin jets responded. Smoothly, predictably. Within a week, 32 pilots had converted from Spitfires to jets. No crashes, no fatalities. Flying Officer Roger stalked his second V-1 of the day. The Meteor's engines produced no roar, no mechanical scream, just a whisper of compressed air. He closed to 800 yards. The V-1 sensors detected nothing. At 400 yards, Roger squeezed the trigger. His Hispano cannons erupted. The flying bomb disintegrated in a fireball. He banked away through the debris, untouched. October 1944. Meteors attacked a formation of 100 American B-24s and B-17s, escorted by 40 Mustangs and Thunderbolts. The jets came from above, diving through 20,000 feet at speeds no piston fighter could match, attacking the bombers, then escaping downward through the formation before escorts could react. The American crews, rattled, requested immediate tactical doctrine updates. The age of the jet had arrived and traditional air combat was obsolete. Except it wasn't. Not yet. Because Britain had made a decision that defied military logic. The meteor would remain invisible. RAF command issued explicit orders. No meteor shall fly beyond Allied lines. No meteor shall operate east of Eindhoven. If shot down over enemy territory, German or Soviet engineers could reverse-engineer Britain's most valuable technological secret. The turbojet represented years of development, millions in investment, and potentially decades of air superiority. So while ME-262's ravaged American bomber formations, Meteor pilots sat at RAF Manston in Kent, watching the war from the sidelines. Their frustration was palpable. They trained. They waited. They hunted flying bombs, unmanned missiles that couldn't fight back. We had the speed to catch them, one pilot reported. We longed to prove ourselves against the Luftwaffe's jets. But secrecy demanded sacrifice. The Meteor's existence remained classified even from most Allied personnel. Test flights required police roadblocks around airfields. Non-essential personnel evacuated. Witnesses threatened with prosecution under the Official Secrets Act. When meteors moved to RAF Manston, civilians who glimpsed the propellerless aircraft assumed they'd hallucinated or witnessed experimental German weapons. Even America was kept in the dark, initially. One meteor was eventually traded to the U.S. for a Bell YP-59A era comet for comparative evaluation. American test pilots were astonished the British jet was faster, more reliable, and operationally deployed while America's remained experimental. Then came the breakthrough. By January 1945, with the improved Meteor F-3s in service, RAF Command finally authorized deployment to mainland Europe. 
Four meteors arrived at Melsbrook, Belgium on 20th January 1945, three weeks after the Luftwaffe's surprise New Year's Day attack. Their mission? Protect the airfield. Prove Mi-262s into combat. But the restriction remained. Do not fly over German-occupied territory. Even in Belgium, meteor pilots were caged. On 17 April 1945, the meteor entered combat over Europe, attacking German ground targets near Ijemuiden. No air-to-air -air encounters. The Luftwaffe, starved of fuel and decimated by months of Allied bombing, couldn't challenge them. The ME-262 versus meteor dogfight that could have defined the jet age never happened. By war's end, meteors had destroyed 46 German aircraft, all through ground attacks. For German pilots, the meteor represented a phantom threat. They knew it existed. Intelligence reports confirmed British jet operations, but they'd never encountered one. The psychological warfare was deliberate. Britain wanted Germany to imagine capabilities far beyond reality. Every rumor magnified. Every sighting exaggerated. We heard the British had hundreds, recalled one Luftwaffe pilot. We didn't know they'd forbidden them from crossing the lines. For British pilots, the psychological toll was different. Frustration mixed with pride. They flew the fastest fighter in Allied service, yet they'd never tested it against worthy opponents. Squadron leader Watts, after his cannons jammed during his first V-1 interception, summarized the paradox. We had the most advanced aircraft in the world, and we were using it against robots. But for civilians in London and southern England, the Meteor was salvation incarnate. When V-1s approached, Meteor pilots scrambled, their jet engines producing none of the Merlin's romantic roar, just an eerie turbine whisper. Citizens learned to recognize the sound. That's ours. Safety. American bomber crews, after the October training exercises, reported a different fear. If the Germans deploy these in numbers, we're finished. The mock attacks demonstrated that traditional fighter escort tactics were obsolete. Interceptors, diving from 30,000 feet at 500 plus miles per hour, couldn't be stopped by Mustangs cruising at 380 miles per hour. One American gunner's log entry captured the dread. They were there, then gone. We didn't even have time to track them. God help us if Germany masters this technology. They said luck was all that kept them alive. Against jets, skill became secondary to chance. The Meteor's true power wasn't in its airframe. It was in the factories that built it. Frank Whittle's journey began not in a laboratory, but in a working-class Coventry household, where his mechanic father taught him to machine parts by hand. Those skills would prove essential. When Whittle patented his turbojet design in 1930, the RAF dismissed it as impractical fantasy. His patent lapsed in 1934 because he couldn't afford the renewal fee. But in 1936, private investors funded Power Jets Limited, and Whittle's vision finally had backing. The first successful bench test occurred on 12 April 1937 in a factory near Coventry. The engine shrieked, overheated, and nearly exploded. Witnesses fled. But it worked. By 1941, Whittle's W.1 engine powered the Gloucester E-2839, Britain's first jet aircraft, proving turbojet feasibility. While Germany's jet program enjoyed government support from its inception, Britain's emerged from scraps. Private investment, skeptical bureaucrats, and an engineer who worked six hours per week on his jet while fulfilling full-time RAF duties. The industrial comparison was stark. Germany, precision manufacturing, exotic alloys, temperamental engines requiring constant maintenance. Britain, mass production capabilities, standard materials, engines that just worked. Gloucester Aircraft Company and Armstrong Whitworth split production. By 1944, factories produced multiple meteors weekly 
Mechanics trained on conventional aircraft could service jets within days. The supply chain required no rare materials, no specialized tools. One factory worker at Armstrong Whitworth later recalled, I built engines knowing my son flew Spitfires over France. When meteors arrived, I built those too. Ten engines left my station every week. I never met the pilots, but I knew they were out there, flying what I'd made. By 1945, Britain had produced hundreds of operational jets, while Germany's ME-262 production, hampered by Allied bombing, material shortages, and Hitler's meddling, barely exceeded 1,400 total aircraft, most never reaching operational squadrons. This wasn't just a weapon. It was Britain itself, forged in Midlands factories, by workers who understood that wars are won not by genius alone, but by the capacity to produce genius at scale. Two philosophies collided in 1944, and only one survived. Germany built the ME-262 as a masterpiece, engineered to perfection, sophisticated, temperamental. It demanded elite pilots, specialized mechanics, exotic fuels. It was the ultimate expression of German technical ambition. Superior by design, limited by reality. Britain built the Meteor as a tool, reliable, maintainable, scalable. It wasn't beautiful. It wasn't the fastest. But it could fly missions day after day without catastrophic failure. It could be serviced by mechanics who'd learned on hurricanes. It could be produced faster than it was lost. After the war, captured German engineers studied the Meteor with grudging respect. Your engines are crude, one remarked to Whittle, but they endure. Whittle smiled. Endurance wins wars. The Meteor never achieved the ME-262's mystique. It never scored hundreds of bomber kills. It never inspired terror in enemy pilots. But it existed. Operational, reliable, ready. When Germany's vaunted jets were grounded by fuel shortages, engine failures, and a collapsing logistics network. On 4 August 1944, flying officer Dixie Dean climbed out of his meteor after that first wingtip kill, his hands still shaking. A ground crewman asked what it felt like to fly the future. Dean looked at his aircraft, stubby, ungainly, with its barrel-shaped engines jutting from the wings, and said something that captured Britain's entire wartime philosophy. It's not pretty, but it works. Decades later, in 1953, when RAF pilot Sergeant John Hale scored the Royal Australian Air Force's last air-to-air -air kill in a meteor during the Korean War, the aircraft was already obsolete. Outclassed by swept-wing MiG-15s and F-86 Sabres, it had been relegated to ground attack missions. Yet it flew. It fought. It endured. In the end, it wasn't genius that decided the war. It was endurance. The capacity to build weapons that worked, supply them consistently, and deploy them without hesitation. Britain kept the meteor secret not from fear of its weaknesses, but from confidence in its potential. That caution, paradoxically, ensured its success. The jet age arrived not with thunder, but with a whisper. And Britain, quietly, changed aviation forever.